separate? I think we'll go separately. Okay. We'll go uh, one by one by one. All right. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, hearing everyone talk about uh, JPS and your experience touring um, was wonderful and um, really does uh, uh, connect with and resonate with what we saw, which is an incredible set of people. I mean, it, it really about the uh, people, the leadership and the staff, that energy that you talked about, the camaraderie, and, and the leadership there that it comes down from is uh, very impressive. We're, we are at a lot of places. This is, this is special. So uh, congrats to you on that. Um, I'm Greg Vaishan. Um, I'm here with uh, Karen Bhatia. We are with Health Management Associates. HMA. HMA is a research and consulting firm that's uh, nationwide. We have about uh, 20 offices across the country. We uh, focus on publicly financed uh, health care. So it's uh, federal, state uh, delivery systems, and that's the team that came here. It was not just Karen and I. We had, we had others helping us uh, for sure. The team that came here that was focused on that delivery system part of our, uh, of our practice. Uh, I'm a physician uh, in internal medicine. I see patients still at an FQHC on the south side of Chicago. I've been with HMA since 2008, and before that I was with Cook County Health and Hospital Systems as a medical director in the ambulatory system. Um, Karen, uh, Dr. Karen Bhatia, a PhD a psychologist, but her, uh, as she'll speak to, uh, she started organizations to uh, really coordinate care and take care of complex patients. Um, and is going around the country now helping other systems and helping with diversion programs and setting up behavioral health practices for communities. So um, as, as you said, her role is, uh, is very important here. All right, well before we, and, and by the way, uh, interrupt if you have questions, please do, and we can uh, answer those as we go along. Um, before we start on the delivery system, we'll go to an earlier part of the report, which was really about the trends, the kind of what's, what's happening now and looks like it will be happening in the future that JPS will need to operate under. Uh, one of those, and these are kind of uh, big high-level high trends, one of those is the culture of health, which is really a, um, a way of looking at health at a community and political level, that in order to, as a system, uh, have good health in communities, you need to have uh, equity in terms of transportation and opportunity, um, and so it's, a, it's much bigger than uh, the health system itself, which is the next one. Health system transformation, which has been going on for many years now, uh, but is really accelerating with uh, what we'll talk about later, which is value-based payments. So it's health system transformations are accelerating because of payment and because of uh, capabilities. There's really... Uh, uh, H HIEs and uh, data aggregation pieces that are going around, going on that are allowing for these health systems to really uh, make that transformation. So we got the political kind of community level, the health system level, and then down <coughs> to the person, where really a trend is to, and it, it's been there for a long time, but now we have everyone talking about it and moving health systems to do it, which is to see the person as a whole person, whole person care. Uh, supporting their behavioral and social needs and medical needs. Value-based payments, which kind of drives, uh, is driving uh, uh, all of this. And that's switching from payments for units of care. Um, and a, for instance, might be uh, MRI. You pay $1,000 for an MRI or more. So you're paying $1,000 each time an MRI. That's a fee for service. Going to value-based is paying for 100,000 people and thinking about how can we best use that MRI unit we have to get the outcomes we want? So that's just a for instance, but taking it at a population level and paying for it actually at that population level, not on delivering service after service. And then lastly, medical education uh, and supply. There are different needs than what is getting channeled up now through uh, education. More primary care, uh, new roles like community health workers, so um, different roles. Um, more of certain roles to kind of support these uh, value-based payments, and integrating population health and these co uh, concepts into the educational process. Just some other ones that, uh, to highlight um, that, that JPS will also be uh, operating in is kind of these trends of personal uh, responsibility um, and healthy behaviors, um, consumerism, kind of uh, uh, patient or 
person choice in making uh, health care choices. Uh, competition and consolidation. We know that a lot of health systems are buying up other health systems. Hospitals are buying up primary care practices. Hospitals are going after uh, SNFs. So a lot of uh, consolidation to kind of make good on these uh, value-based payments which go across the uh, uh, whole continuum. And then expensive medical interventions. We saw hep hepatitis C kind of really hit uh, states. Um, there are more of those coming along. So some key points um, about uh, JPS. Uh, just as uh, all of you said as you went around and, and talking about uh, what you know about JPS, it is a critical provider. We got that from stakeholders as well. We see it in our own um, assessment uh, of JPS. But capacity is strained. Uh, this, this you brought up a, a, as well. Um, it's not, there are not enough services to meet the demands of the population. The supply is inadequate uh, right now, and the population is only growing. And as we heard at the, uh, uh, at the court meeting uh, two weeks ago, prevention is foundational. Um, this is uh, throughout the report. When you're, when you're getting a value-based payment for a population, you want to prevent. And prevention could be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Tertiary prevention means that person already has the bad outcome. They've already gotten diabetes and had a heart attack, and now you're trying to prevent further events for that person. They've already gone down the line. But you want to start all the way at the primary in smoking, decreasing smoking, getting people to exercise more. So across the range on, on uh, prevention. Delivery system as a whole, and then we'll, we'll get down in particulars, um, as you can see, these kind of strengths uh, relate to educational missions as well. There's residencies uh, attached to the first three here. Trauma with uh, the only level one in the county and a uh, emergency medicine residency. Behavioral health, which Karen will talk about with a psychiatry residency. Uh, a nationally recognized family medicine uh, program. I was in, uh, incredibly impressed with the uh, candidates and who you were able to uh, recruit. Uh, nurses being prepared to take on uh, uh, care of elders through this niche, niche de designation. And then NCQA, level, uh, uh, recognized patient-centered medical homes. That's a big deal that as a primary care system, you're prepared to do uh, coordinated, comprehensive uh, care that gives access to those who are, uh, who are within the system. Uh, this is a view that uh, we'll go through quickly that will organize uh, you know, what we're talking about today under. That really there's three pillars here to making sure that a complex, um, a person with complex problems, so maybe someone with serious mental illness and diabetes, what they kind of uh, need to support their uh, wellness, which is yes, medical services, but also behavioral health and then the community um, support and services as well. And bringing those and tying those together around a, a person. Um, is the way we'll uh, organize or think through how we're stepping through this, uh, uh, this presentation. The first area will be over on the medical uh, services, primary care. Secondly, population health and care management, which is really bringing together of all of those uh, components, stitching them together. Third area will be uh, other medical specialty ER continuum, which is uh, uh, things like skilled nursing facilities and rehab. And then lastly, um, uh, but not least for sure, uh, uh, behavioral health. All right, so to go to uh, primary care and um, uh, strengths there, it is that NCQA designation, which certain things you've got to do there to get that, um, which is a prepared primary care uh, team to meet you as a patient. Uh, focus on, on quality and uh, performance. You go into a health center and you see a big uh, data board that patients also see and that the staff sees every day as they come in and people are paying attention to and you do see uh, improvement on there. So uh, a, a nice focus there. Your EMR is kind of uh, you know, best in class. It's, uh, physicians are frustrated with any EMR for sure, but this is, uh, this is one that you know, gives you a lot of uh, potential. Uh, centering pregnancy, kind of the best uh, practice for prenatal care. And then urgent care, not, not the kind of urgent care in an emergency room, but the ability to see people for sore throats and sprains, et cetera, kind of distributed um, out in the uh, community by having weekend hours and, and having those uh, same-day slots available. Focus areas certainly is access. I mean, that is a core component of the NCQA PCMH. 
but really here is a problem with just too much demand for not enough primary care supply. And that just makes it difficult to get into uh, primary care. Some variable productivity, very high at the school-based clinics. Um, uh, uh, more variable in other places, perhaps no-shows and um, uh, more complex patients. So that's worth delving into uh, more on that. Um, and then uh, a strategy for cultural competence and language at, uh, at across the whole system, but um, in primary care, for sure. But the overwhelming uh, finding is something that I you know, heard some of you talk about, which is this uh, mismatch of supply and demand. Uh, that's seen in a lot of different ways. One of them is the 72 days to the next available new appointment, so if you're calling up and you need to get in. Um, another one we'll talk about later is getting from the emergency room into an appointment. Um, coming in for uh, cancer care at later stages of cancer. Um, there's, there's various ways that this represents itself uh, downstream. But what we see pictorially there is that there's a, that big blue bar of need and uh, you know, JPS is making a solid uh, run at it and fulfilling some of that need and there's other providers that you'll continue to need to work with to do it, but it's not meeting the total primary care needs of the population. And there's a low capacity for geriatric care. That set of the population is growing quickly um, and is, is worth uh, focus. So recommendation is to plan for an increase in uh, primary care capacity and to strengthen uh, that little bar of the FQHC and TAC. Population health, um, that's looking at the uh, kind of the big picture, the iceberg underneath, um, the, the whole population, even those that are at low risk that will be coming into your door in a year or two years, so to, to look across the population and start uh, doing uh, prevention. And care management is really looking at, okay, these are, the, these are the people that are in our system and are at high risk or that we can impact. There's things we can do, uh, coaching, education, support, coordination of their care, things that we can do to manage their care and help them. Um, so this is at the tip of the iceberg. This is at uh, uh, population health is the whole thing. When we talk about uh, population health, this is kind of another uh, three-pillar piece where the delivery system is one part of delivering optimal population health. There are other components. You are working with uh, public health. Obviously, there's uh, specific program, programs there to keep you connected, but that's an important connection to make and to strengthen in order to get that optimized population health across uh, everyone. And then, importantly, in the report, you'll see this idea of a suggestion for an accountability structure. What do we mean there? That could be a health plan. It could be an ACO. But it's a way of bringing that uh, population health payment to some discipline around that and a structure around that, that there is um, a, a way of being accountable for cost, quality, and patient experience across a population um, and uh, uh, connection that's 40,000 patients, but there's 400,000 that are eligible, and someone from amongst that rest of that population could come in tomorrow or next month or next year, and to 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 create some accountability across all of that um, is a is a suggestion. Uh, population health care uh, uh, and care management um, at JPS, as I was just saying, there there is some of that for JPS, but not for those people who have not yet been seen, those who are coming in next year, that bigger pie. So that's a, um, uh, saying that, again, on the first bullet. Uh, health information uh, exchange and data warehousing, bringing all of that information into one place and applying data analytics to it so you can see who amongst all that population needs attention. That capacity needs to be built. It's, it's, not, it's not where it needs to be for a, for a system to succeed not now, okay, but in five years or ten years, that, that really uh, needs to be uh, in place. There is some uh, specific population health management being done at uh, various places. Uh, one of them is the primary care centers for pe people with diabetes and other diseases. But again, that's not for that whole population uh, out there. And care management is, is starting with a focus on care transitions, people coming out of the hospital, um, and ensuring that they don't come back in, but there is definitely uh, a piece around behavioral health and making sure that that is part of the whole care management uh, program that needs to uh, be put in place. 
when you talk about the health information exchange, are you talking about internal <coughs> to the system or community wide? Community wide, that there's there's an ability to see, you know, that someone has been in another emergency right. room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the recommendation here is a really a risk informed that re requires that accumulation of data, data analytics around it to find who are the right people to uh, reach out for, reach out to. Um, so that's a, that's a suggestion there on a, on a I have bill. a question. Sure. Yep. When you're talking about population health management, are you referring to the entire population of the county, or are you talking about a subgroup? Yeah. So on, on that, there is some connection to the public health piece, and they have responsibility, I would say, for the whole county. Public health. Have for JPS. Over there? Vinny, for, you hear that? <laughs> yeah, for the, for the public health, yeah. yeah, public health, whole county. For for JPS, what you want to do is have that accountability structure in some way defined so that the, the health system knows, okay, this is the population that uh, we are responsible for and we'll apply our data analytics and our uh, population health programming around. So it's it's a it's a combination of, of, of pieces for for different segments of the population. Public health for the whole, JPS for those that you define as this is our focus for accountability. So we would have data, health data, flowing from various sources within town county to public health. The, Essentially, uh, uh, places have structured it uh, that way. Um, yes, we, we definitely have. It's not necessary to. It's not necessary to do it that way, uh, but it is one. Uh, one way of having a neutral kind of actor that everyone feels, you know, is okay. in the public interest. So it has worked in other places, for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And as it relates to the HIE, the Health Information Exchange, public health runs a, a fairly aggressive and comprehensive HIE that is not just simply JPS driven, but it's all the hospitals. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very effective system, and we've been noted as being, being a, a stellar performer in that particular area. That information is shared with not only all the other hospitals, but also with with Peter Smith. Maybe that we have to enlarge it. We're moving toward a, a data warehouse issue at, at public health that encompasses the entire county. Yeah. But JPS is a major player in, in the provision of information into that system so that we can disseminate it and do our own analytics on that data. Is that a county-owned property of, of, of the HIE, or is it, or is it contracted out? It, it is county-owned, uh, set up within our own uh, IT department. And um, uh, by the way, I'm Vinny Taneja, health director for the county. Um, and the uh, JPS hospital system was the first one actually to partner with public health to sort of show what can be done with a public setup of an HIE. So the purpose initially has been limited for reportable disease surveillance, but once the structure is there and other hospitals start participating more robustly, the purpose can be expanded to meet other needs. Yeah, you get into a lot of legal debate on structure and, and accessibility and protection and privacy issues. So. Yeah, the, the one good thing is that public health is behind that uh, HIPAA firewall. So when you look at public health in these type of arenas, they have the same responsibilities plus the same access and the ability to distribute that information as, as medical facilities do because you know, you're going to hear this term eventually of, of being behind the firewall. That means that you're in a protected class that can deal with that and it's secure and things such as that. Yeah, we, we run into those issues um, all the time, but uh, I think public health addresses them quite, quite well. The key is, is that is that you're going to hear in these presentations, I don't want to take over your presentation, but, but where public health should be more active in various roles, and there may be some, some belief that there isn't a, a strong collaboration between public health and JPS and the other hospitals. There is a strong collaboration, and uh, in fact, we're, we're trying to put together a report for you all to show specifically where public health and JPS collaborate on, on a variety of issues. Well, I think, I think that accessibility of the information is critical for protection against duplication, unnecessary duplication of services, but if you do have some more issues there. Just a quick 
I'm one of the board member at JPS also as well. Can I just can you get a microphone, please? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to um, set up the right expectation. When you deal with HIE, you have to be very careful because we still in the culture of fee for service. So the stuff inside the medical record is to support the payment system. And most of the stuff that when you manage lives is actually in the discrete notes and it's not publicly available in the HIE. So be careful as we transform to the new model. But if we expect everything is in the HIE system medical record, we're that wrong. Yeah. So, just want to make that so just one clarification point. Currently, the structure is a, a public Could health you get a HIE. <laughs> Sorry. So, so the current structure is a limited purpose public health HIE. It is for reportable conditions only that by law all healthcare providers are supposed to report. So with partnership with JPS, we're trying to show electronic automation of that information instead of somebody having to remember to report. That's why it's a very limited purpose. Like I said, if, if the need grows and we become sort of the default HIE, obviously those considerations will come into play. But right now it's for a public health use only. And JPS benefits from that data. We just had a you know, collaboration meeting looking at their population health. There's a center for uh, health co outcomes research. So they're looking and seeing how they can benefit from the data that we already have access to through their system. Excellent. All right, so to hit some uh, special populations that uh, are worth uh, mentioning, geriatrics we did uh, mention earlier as a, a quickly growing uh, uh, population. Um, there are currently uh, programs at JPS. One of them was that uh, nurse designation, niche uh, designation. Um, also a fellowship and uh, trauma care for elders. Just a, a lot of um, things, some of them out in the primary care centers. So good things happening, but uh, that can be brought together into a coordinated way of um, uh, strengthening the geriatric uh, capabilities of JPS. Uh, on the pediatric side, you have a lot of school-based uh, clinics. Uh, uh, those children are getting their tertiary care when they need it at Cook's. So uh, increasing that uh, partnership in terms of uh, HIE and working together on population health initiatives would make sense. Uh, cancer is one where we know demographically uh, population is getting older. Uh, lots of new treatments that are uh, you know, thankfully making cancer more of a chronic disease for some. The population though, of those with active uh, cancer is growing and it would make sense to uh, uh, put where you already have a strength, um, uh, more resources. Uh, specialty care, so now we're on a, a new subject, but uh, cancer care is certainly up there as well as far as a strength of your uh, specialty system. Another strength, although this is not across all specialties, but it's, um, it, it is a strength both in primary care and here, which is that a structure of a claim and uh, the JPS uh, system really with uh, leadership that crosses over and great cooperation. We've seen it other ways. Um, it's looking very good here in terms of uh, how, you've, how you've set it up. Uh, areas for focus, uh, you, you saw the specialty uh, area, very tough to work in. It's uh, impacting efficiency uh, within those systems. And uh, another area of focus is using technology. Uh, we'll see at the next presentation, there are a lot of specialty needs, just like primary care, that are not being met. There's a, uh, a demand that's much higher for those services, using technology to try to expand that access. Things like e-consults, where someone, a uh, primary care physician is, is seeing someone, they put in an e-consult, someone in another place in time, a specialist, answers <coughs> that back. It saves the patient the rigmarole of going all the way into the, to the visit. It's more quick, it's more efficient, and over half of specialty visits in some specialties can be done that way. Um, and then uh, benchmarking the uh, productivity to make sure once you have that efficient space that you're hitting the uh, numbers that, that, that make sense. Uh, just like primary care, demands far exceeding supply. Third next available there. We saw 72 on the primary care side. Here it's up to 12 months in some of the specialties. Uh, less than others, but, but still uh, a, a lot of demand there. And uh, really with the way that the space is configured now, it's hard to know, you know, do you have all of the, have you, do you have all of the uh, supply that you can from your uh, current specialty resources? There's a lot to be done there in terms of uh, opening that up to efficient space and using technology to, to, to improve that. So create new space, referral management system with rules, um, and using e-consults uh, in ways that make sense for the system. 
emergency room, uh, you know, very busy, uh, big 122,000 visits. That, that is a busy emergency room. There's long waits, uh, often over 24 hours to get up to the floors. That's both an acute uh, bed issue, but uh, there's flow and efficiency issues in the emergency room itself. Um, and leaving that emergency room, as we said, very hard to get a uh, primary care uh, appointment. And that's on the primary care side, but certainly having some programming that, and that's on the recommendations, to get those high impact, at least, high impact individuals into primary care uh, makes sense. And then to create adjacencies with urgent care and, and make the flow in the emergency room such that you're, you're getting those uh, efficiencies. Inpatient, we've said this a couple times, trauma, uh, a huge uh, strength uh, of the system. The uh, idea of having multiple beds in a room is kind of uh, history. Uh, there's there's uh, safety uh, issues there, privacy issues. It's not what people expect. Um, so that's that's something that's you know currently a problem. And then the two towers, uh, various uh, of you talked about how that's creating inefficiencies uh, currently. So a, a recommendation there to really um, go about, which is what you're doing, thinking about new uh, facilities. On the continuum of care, uh, that aging population that, uh, that we heard about is likely, and the drive on value-based payments to get people out of the hospital more quickly uh, is going to increase demand for rehab, skilled nursing facilities, and for capabilities to get the person home sooner through mo home monitoring and technologies and, and being able to support them at home. Uh, in that way. So starting to uh, enable the system to do that uh, would make sense. Um, I will now do the... Excuse me. Yes. yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, could you go back to the previous slide? Uh-huh. The one before that, when we had the, the multiple... Yes, that one. Okay, so when we went on the tour, that was extremely just heartbreaking to see, frankly. Can you talk a little bit about the, the legality of having multiple bedrooms, and are are they in compliance at this particular point? Is JPS in compliance? I would say it's it's in compliance, so that part, but it, it makes it harder to uh, create that privacy environment that's expected. So, you, you know, you increase your challenges to deliver on the compliance. It's not that you can't be compliant inside of that. It just makes it more challenging. So it's, okay. it is a it is a high challenge environment, and the expectations are changing throughout the healthcare system. Would Would you those. agree that as we're trying to project the future, that the current conditions as they are, they could be out of compliance, knowing that there's going to be changes? I mean, in, in healthcare, would you could you speak to that? I wouldn't say there. I wouldn't go. Uh, so far, to say they're out of compliance, I would say it puts the system at risk, and it's not worth that. It, so it's, it, it's a risk piece. High risk, and, right? High risk. And it's just not, it, you know, it doesn't work. Um, so I would say it's... Well, I, 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 I want you to speak on the risk, because it it was extremely tight. I don't even understand how a piece of equipment could go right. in. Um, the CEO, you know, was... Um, very transparent that his team does the best that they can with what they have, and I appreciate that. Yes. As a taxpayer, I really need you to speak to, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but to explain to our citizens as well that as we're projecting investing into this hospital, the system, that it's very likely that it could be outdated. And be more costly Even more so. to leave in place because of, because of risks uh, and you. various kinds. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I can add a couple things that may help. I mean, number one, it's, you, it's such a grandfathered in, semi-private bed. So, um, I'm Sam Sears with uh, Percival Health Advisors, so I'm helping on the facility issues of this project. It's basically grandfathered in, right? So older facilities that have semi-private beds are still allowed to operate. You could not, for example, build a new hospital today with anything but all private beds. So it is... It is going forward illegal to build anything like that. So that is considered the new standard of care. It's because of infection, all sorts of uh, behavioral issues, all sorts of risk issues. So the reasons why you, you can't even go 100% on semi-private beds is because you can't have, for example, pediatrics and adults sharing the same room, people with behavioral health issues, gender issues, all sorts of issues, people with, uh, you know, that, that have infectious disease, et cetera. So there's all sorts of 
times where you can't even use all the beds because of those rules. But clearly the standard of care going forward. So while you are technically in compliance because of grandfathered rules, you are not meeting the standards of care, and it is, in fact, illegal to build a semi-private bed in a new hospital today, if that helps. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, and I want to add one thing. She was sitting here asking, and I said, bring it up, please. <laughs> <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the other leadership part of this equation is if you are nursing staff and hospital support staff, is it easy to imagine that it would be more glamorous to go to a place where every patient is in a, in a nice, quiet, private room? Uh, and so the fact that this leadership keeps nurses and staff coming back, knowing every day they're going to that kind of situation, is kudos. Now, I want to segue that into the fact that we had these conversations before about a bond issue. And in my personal opinion, and I'll state it as just that, there was an awful lot of pushback by individuals and taxpayers who hadn't been near John Peter Smith Hospital and had not a clue what situations are there. So I'm going to say going forward again. I've said that twice today, haven't I? <coughs> going forward, it's important that we let these folks know yeah. that we have to get better. Yes. That's, I'm, I'm through. Thank you. That, that, was, that was my, uh, that was the point I was going to make. She raised that one. But I was visibly struck by the behavioral um, clinic. I mean, on the 10th floor, and he had all of these people who were obviously mm -hmm. challenged, and do we have as citizenry the political will to, you notice he said in one of the slides, we have to build new facilities? Hello? Yeah. I mean, that's going to cost money, uh, and, do, and do we as <laughs> We can sit here and pontificate, but some, at some point the rubber has to meet the road, and the behavioral folks are going to have to have the facilities and the inpatient. We're going to have to have it. So we have to make the kind of tough decision here on how we're going to do this, and if we have the political will and how we inform our um, fellow citizens that this is an absolute critical need. I agree. I agree. Well, but, 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 you know, I think you, you're using <clears throat> the operative term. It's information. It's marketing. Yeah. It's helping people to know that a need exists. If, if, if that's not communicated, then people so don't know. I mean, again, yeah. we took the tour. We have a facility in Arlington that's open from 6 a.m. to 8.30 p.m., which I think is outstanding. Mm -hmm. But I pass the thing almost every day. I mean, you know, pardon me, not thing, but, but I pass the facility every day. And I was highly impressed when I went on the inside. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, when I ask staff about it, they say, well, we don't market. I mean, so, yeah, it's, we know, you know, our group, we know that. I mean, it doesn't take a you know, rocket science to know that, that our facilities are outdated. But if that is not... If it's not communicated that JPS is is viable, it's alive, it's working for you, if you don't communicate that, then no, people don't want to spend dollars. They don't want to spend money on anything that they don't think that they can benefit from. And then we may have facilities that's built already that aren't being used to their full potential. You know, so here again, here I sit from Southeast Arlington, you know, my area, Southeast Tarrant County. And, and again, I say, yeah, the big hospital needs A, B, C, and D. I, I mean, I checked that off the list. But then if, if you're asking people who I serve in my part of the county, what is JPS doing for me, then I need to be able to communicate that. But if I'm not, because all this is pertinent, I think we all know this. Every one of us. But if we do not say to, 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 to the leadership, okay, now bring it to the other folks, the other people outside of Fort Worth, right. then, you know, we're beating a drum. And, and, and we lose votes. Yeah. We lose votes. And we can't afford to lose votes, to given what that. we've seen in the demographics that's, that's right. coming up for the next few that's years. Right. But then... Colleville and Hearst and everybody yeah. else has to be just as invested exactly. in this as exactly. Fort Worth is. Exactly. 
Well, has to well pay. I think down the road we're going to have to have uh, some sort of significant discussion about this communication because um, yeah. I think we're going to easily be able to determine within this room what we're going to need. Right. Right. But like Lorraine said, if you go out to Colleyville, if you go out to Hazlitt, if you go out, although that might be Denton County, I'm not sure about Hazlitt, um, you even go to Arlington. Sure. If you get, once you get out of this bubble good. here, I can tell you there are lots of people that not only don't know any of this stuff, but they also have a lot of misinformation That's about right GPS. Mm -hmm. and, and this won't happen with just a couple of billboards. I mean, we're going to have to, you know, dig get, deep. we're going to have to dig deep, and we're going to need a really in-depth communication program that we're going to have to get with the JPS leadership on that. because uh, otherwise what's going to happen is we're all going to be gun ho and the way voters are these days, they're very touchy about their taxes, and I am too, by the way. But if you can't, if you can't prove to me that something is of my benefit, right. then I'm probably going to vote against it. I mean, that's just a fact of life. That isn't, that's, and that's what we're going to be going up against. So I'm really concerned, Pastor Evans, about that, that I guess it's outside the donut mm -hmm. hole, so to speak, because they could just completely outvote everything we try to get out. I think Fort Worth is going to be with us, but I'm, I'm really worried about the rest of the county. But that's going to be a whole nother, and I didn't want to chase that rabbit too far, but I think <laughs> yeah. you, you have hit something that, that I, I think know Lorraine, very important point. Lorraine and I are really kind of nervous about, and, well, uh, and it's going to be a challenge. Pastor Evans, I, I want to share with you the reason that we don't market the Arlington, the, the Southeast medical, medical Home in Arlington is because the capacity has been exceeded. Uh, so there's no point to market something or we can't take any additional patients. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Well, I think that there are actually two pieces to the marketing. What you just said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, why, why are you going to try to overwhelm uh, the clinic that's already totally. there? But there's another piece of the marketing about, and maybe, maybe it ought to be called education, mm -hmm. but there is a just a, a lot of misinformation about JPS among voters in Tarrant County that are they're, they're just going to vote against it because they don't even because of all the misinformation they've got or all the old prejudices that they have of what they think JPS is and that's that's going to take some very calculated and strategic communication I'm not I don't have the answer by the way but I'm hoping that uh, JPS or the consultants can help us out um, because no matter what we come up with here, if we can't get through that piece, we're never going to get. We're never going to get this. And we constantly spend, uh, Commissioner, because we know if if you're already at capacity, and you can't promise more than you can deliver. So if you're already at capacity, um, what happens when you know that there's going to be more people coming in okay. uh, to, and trying to impact the system? And how do you handle that? I mean, if you're already at capacity, then you've got people that are left out there unserved. So how, what do we do? And if we can't address that now, and knowing we're going to have increased capacity, that, I mean, it's incumbent upon us, I think, to really sure. move this. Well, one of the things we also are going to get into in a couple of uh, meetings down the road is, uh, you know, JPS is going to uh, come to us with a kind of a financial report and mm -hmm. such. Not all of this has to be funded by a, a bonds. There is some internal cash flow that occur. I don't know what it is, but I know that that's how they've been they've been funding the projects since 1985. Is that going to cover everything? Absolutely not. But it will cover some things, and I don't know how much it will be. But that's going to be all part of the decision making process as we go down the road on this. So anyhow, good good. Good discussion. Good questions. But I want to make one comment that uh, I believe if we propose a sensible solution, then the people will support it. As long as that solution has been vetted mm -hmm. and the people have been heard. Um, we, we are obviously facing a multitude of problems, challenges now and in the future. Some of those problems can be solved by expanded capacity. Some of those problems can be solved by financing tools. But many of them, like prevention at yeah. the yeah. 
primary level, the secondary level, and so forth, those can't be solved by money or by building new buildings. It has to be solved by a strategic, intentional collaboration among various entities, whether it's in Arlington or in South Lake. And I think that's the missing piece, right? So because we, we, we know that given the growth that we are expecting, uh, we won't be able to meet the capacity. So we're going to have to do something to lessen the bottleneck. We have to do something. What that something is a critical piece to the overall solution, and we have to figure that out, what that something is. Okay. Ready? You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. ready. Here we go. So first of all, let me just say thank you very much for having us, and I echo all of, of Greg's uh, comments, and that this is a work of a team, a team effort, and thank you very much to JPS and all of you in the room for having us today. I, I do want to also share uh, some perspective as a consultant who does have the opportunity to travel in a fair amount of different types of public systems within the country, it is rather unusual for me to come into a room where the majority of people are saying out loud that behavioral health is an issue, a concern, and something that must be addressed. So, so I want to start there and, and applaud you for that recognition and talk a little bit about some of the strengths of your system and some of the things that you've already highlighted as the challenges and, and move very quickly into some recommendations. So one thing just to be crystal clear about is that there are quite a few resources for behavioral health. There is not everything that you would want countywide. And specifically for people who don't have funding, there is a lack of services. That being said, it is clearly recognized across your service delivery system and all of the people that we spoke to that JPS is the go-to provider when you are trying to help somebody who has the most complex behavioral health needs. And, and just for, the, for clarity, behavioral health stands for two different types of terms. It is both mental health care, which you've also been using as psychiatric care, but it also is for substance abuse services, for people who are addicted to alcohol or other kinds of substances. And, and for the most part, what we are talking about in terms of what you have in place now relies specifically on mental health services. So I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but want to be very clear about that. Your psychiatric emergency center is, um, while, while everyone here has noted, is crowded and very busy. It is a significant community asset not to be underestimated. JPS was very, um, very thoughtful and ahead of the curve in terms of building out a dedicated psychiatric emergency center where both law enforcement could come and drop off people who were struggling with issues rather than taking them to jail, where family members could drop somebody off without having to go through the regular emergency room. And the fact that that is staffed by psychiatry is, is significant as well. So people really can use that as a diversion program, as a diversion tool. Um, we will come back to what, what those recommendations are to add to that because clearly I think as all of you have noted from your tour, that is a very busy center. It is on the 10th floor, which is not an ideal location. One of the other things that was um, quite astonishing to me as somebody who, again, looks at other systems and spends quite a bit of time looking at performance outcomes, is that JPS metrics that are reported far exceed the national benchmarks. Not only are you challenged by your resources, like most behavioral health systems are in this country, and challenged by your facilities, and challenged by shortage of psychiatry and, and beds, and outpatient services, but the fact is that you are doing exceedingly well on achieving performance outcomes. So that is something to really be very proud of. The other thing is that Wayne, sitting back there very humbly, who I will pick on a little bit, um, does coordinate a set of funded services from the federal government to Tarrant County that are really there to help drive some of these outcome metrics that we're talking about. 
So reducing readmissions to psychiatric inpatient units, um, helping primary care doctors have access to psychiatry so they can treat people with mental health issues within their practices are some examples of, of those services. So some of the challenges, I think most of these you all have highlighted on in the discussion so far, and, and I think that Greg has also highlighted as well. And when you, when you think about some of the things that Greg talked about, uh, put them on steroids for behavioral health, and I think that would be a fitting uh, way to think about them. The distance between the Psychiatric Emergency Center and Trinity Springs, where the inpatient beds are, uh, one, you have to go through the tunnel. Everyone got to go through the tunnel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how many of you have ever firsthand experienced a significant psychiatric crisis, whether you yourself have or a family member. Um, we, are, we are talking about people who need to make this transition from an emergency room to an inpatient bed is somebody who is frightened, is potentially seeing things that the rest of us might not see, who is potentially hearing voices telling them to harm themselves or to flee or to harm you, the person who is transporting them. And they are they're very, very frightened. They don't think the way you or I might think at, in, in a normal moment. And, and so if you think about the fact that we are asking um, our staff to transport people through this very long tunnel, um, when someone has experienced that kind of crisis really is a risk, going back to, to the risk factors in terms of our facilities. The um, physical layout of the units is also not ideal. It, and there is not much more that staff can do at JPS to maximize that space. They have been exceptionally creative. They work extremely hard to maintain the space and make it as comforting and warm and, and uh, appropriate to treat behavioral health issues as they possibly can. However, it is a cinder block facility with very limited ability to be flexible. It's dark in certain places, it's cramped in certain places, and again, we have double beds in every room, which means that also all of your beds cannot be used all the time because you may have people in a room who are extremely paranoid, who are aggressive, or could be dangerous. So it's really a, a significant limitation. Uh, in terms of the capacity, you do currently have 132 psychiatric beds. You see the configuration up there. You also have 16 of those 16 are adolescent beds. And in addition, you have 15 med psych beds, which are extremely valuable asset as well. With that being said, and that's not an insignificant number of psychiatric beds, uh, in FY15, 3,100 patients did need to be referred out where the count, where JPS had to pay for those unfunded patients to go to other facilities. Um, those other facilities, as I said before, themselves will tell you that they are not as well equipped to deal with really complicated uh, psychiatric issues. So where are the expansion needs? This is a very long list. And, and this, again, um, does not speak to the fact that you have not maximized every single possible potential that you could. It is just that it is not enough, and the demand is far exceeding the capacity that you currently have. So services for children and adolescents. I don't know how many of you in this room yourself have children or adolescents. Um, adolescents, as you know, probably need mental health supports on a normal basis. Mm -hmm. We are seeing um, within our society and within schools that kids and adolescents are suffering much more. Um, much, we are much more aware of it as a society, and so supports are really critical to provide to those age groups so that as people become adults, they have a better handle on how to help keep themselves healthy and in the community and out of the hospital and out of our criminal justice system. Um, as, as Greg talked about, targeted services for the geriatric and aging populations, this is going to be a significant need, not only from typical aging issues like uh, memory issues and other cognitive issues, 
but also in terms of, of severe depression and anxiety that we see within aging populations. Inpatient beds I'm going to come back to. Um, we will talk about some specific numbers. Most important, though, is the ability to, to really take your system of care and turn it into a continuum of care. Greg started to talk a little bit about that, and from the behavioral health perspective, what would be ideal and recommended <clears throat> is that within your primary care settings, you are truly collaborating and, and creating an integrated behavioral health and physical health delivery system out in those communities where you have, have ambulatory settings and, and others. The idea being that people who have um, lower acuity mental health issues or substance abuse issues can be treated by their primary care physician. That with the support of psychiatry when that's necessary and with embedded and co-located behavioral health specialists, those teams within primary care can really take care of the, the majority of people who have mental health issues. As that type of system is not able to really handle uh, a situation or somebody is not getting better, then the idea is that you, you transition them to more specialty behavioral health services. Right now, um, we, we are in a changing environment, but for the most part, we still have quite a few primary care providers who are very uncomfortable taking care of people with mental health issues, although by far the majority of people who are suffering from mental health issues will show up and go and see their primary care doc first. So, so trying to make sure that we have ways to screen people, which you do now at JPS, and get them into the right setting with the right level of supports is critical and will free up the capacity to be able to see folks who really need more of that specialty wraparound behavioral health services. The, the other thing, just to add to this, is that we know that this, the need is going to continue to grow. And the more we can treat people in their communities um, and really address issues before they become a crisis or someone has to go to the PEC, the better off we are going to be able to do to keep people healthy, not need to use those inpatient beds, and, and also keep people out of the jails. So having better access out in the community, I know Arlington has been, been touched on uh, quite a bit today. People with mental health issues have very uh, difficult challenges getting to facilities. So having mobile opportunities for people, for teams to literally go out into the community or having transportation to help people get to those services is critical. Um, so right now, the bulk of your services, especially in terms of diversion, meaning diversion in terms of the PEC or diversion from an inpatient setting or from, from criminal justice, happen in Fort Worth, uh, it would be definitely helpful to expand some of that to the other communities. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to talk a little bit about substance abuse. Substance abuse um, is happening in your community, and it is not being treated within JPS at this point in time. And we could debate for the next three weeks whether you should provide substance abuse services or not. What I am going to say to you is the fact that people are using substances and that there are not enough resources to treat those substance abuse issues is driving up your medical costs across your system, across the entire county, and that it is driving up your behavioral health, your psychiatric costs, and it, was, it is reducing the ability to be effective as a primary care provider or as a, a mental health provider. So having a strategy, having a system of care that is accessible and can treat people with both mental health and substance use issues is critical and is going to need to be contemplated. And then, as Greg also said, talking about the population health strategy and care management, it is best when an integrated health strategy is created and care management, you do not want to create separate behavioral health care management or population health strategies. So thinking about that together is critical. So a few recommendations uh, for you to chew on. Um, one is this development of a system of care. 
we, when we talk about the needs of the JPS facility, mostly what, what we have been talking about are inpatient needs. And you do have expanded inpatient behavioral health needs, which I'll talk about in a minute. However, it is going to be critical to manage and to keep the number of beds reasonable, which you're, you're going to see in a minute, <coughs> is going to be critical to invest in outpatient ambulatory services. The more you invest there, the less you will need to invest in the inpatient side. It does not mean if you put all of your resources into the outpatient side that you will not need inpatient services, but that is a balance that really needs to be struck here in Tarrant County and something to really think through. Um, without those outpatient services and development of a true system of care, right now you have a pretty fragmented system. There is definitely collaboration between MHMR and Ann Wayne's team. However, that could go much further than it, than it does now. And again, it's a resource issue. So really thinking through how that gets knit together is going to be critical. And then as you start to think about uh, rebalancing of the system and helping people with those lighter touch behavioral health issues be served successfully within your ambulatory settings, which, which you do some of now, but can certainly be expanded, and then really fine-tuning those specialty behavioral health services that will be needed. And then as we think about the hospital-based services, expansion of the PEC is definitely indicated. I think for those of you who are on the tour, and I don't know if you were there on a busy day, or yes, in shaking his head, you were there on a busy day, so I probably don't need to say more. Um, the staff there are extremely creative, and they make room for everybody, and um, it can be very crowded. And the more crowded it is, the more difficult it is to assess people, to move them to where they need to go, and to keep that system moving as cleanly as possible. One of the things that we also would recommend is that you have an observation space so you really can determine if there are folks who can go back out into the community more quickly. Right now, everybody is clustered into a, a large space. And then also, we heard quite a bit from stakeholders about the interest in having a portion of the PEC dedicated to people with substance abuse issues, which, which would definitely be something we would recommend as well. As you think about inpatient beds, we would also recommend that you keep those beds very flexible. <coughs> we don't have good numbers at this point about how many beds you should build that are specifically dedicated to, to the aging population or to geriatrics or to younger children or adolescents. So creating a physical space that allows for the flexibility would be our best recommendation at this point. And then also there are no electroconvulsive therapy services in Tarrant County, and we would recommend that you include that in the, the new design as well. So I want to just take a minute to talk through this chart. And for those of you who've read the report, I'm sure you've looked at this and, and tried to figure out why we are recommending so many beds. So many, many years ago, um, about 15 or so, the standard that was considered appropriate for the number of inpatient beds per 100,000 was, um, was about 50 beds. Nowhere in the country is that threshold met. Current standards in the literature, and, and this is based on um, expert psychiatry testimony, it is based on the trades and the different associations, child and adolescent psychiatry associations, geriatric associations. The best thinking currently, as of last year, is that somewhere between 50 to 70 public beds are needed per 100,000 people. So, so think about that. Um, we thought, as we were trying to come up with some recommendations for you, one, given that nobody actually does accomplish that type of capacity, and two, with the focus of really creating a very robust outpatient and ambulatory set of services and a system of care for behavioral health, that the potential to really manage on a smaller percent, excuse me, smaller percentage of public beds would be indicated. 
So we went with um, the uh, 35 public beds per 100,000. This is based on the fact, you see the assumptions down here, that you will continue to invest in outpatient and diversion services. It's also based on the assumption that you are not going to have much capacity at the state facilities, which currently you don't. And it's also going to assume that you will contract with private facilities, which may or may not be indicated. So there are a lot of assumptions here. So based on that, with your 132 beds now, what we went for was a 50%, that JPS would provide 50% of that need based on the 50% of the evidence-based uh, literature. And you, what you see in that far right column is the gap over the years from the 132 beds that you have now. It's a significant number of, of a gap that is only going to um, exponentially expand. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Greg. Yes? I have a quick question. Is, this based on, is the number based on total population or yes. the population that we serve? No, this is based, the, the evidence, the literature is based on uh, total population. So we did not uh, reduce this to the population that you serve. We did not reduce this in terms of uh, unfunded or poverty levels. This is considered the best expert advice, okay. cut in half. So we really do not feel that it was appropriate to slice or dice it in any other way at this point. Right. You don't know who is going to end up at your door. Assuming that this is the uh, matrix that you use for current um, health care system today, Yes. what happened when you incorporate that to include like musculoskeletal because there's a correlation between psychiatric, I mean not psychiatric, behavioral health and musculoskeletal also as well for the future needs? So we don't have that expertise um, in terms of the literature. Hmm. What this does not include your med psych beds, which mm -hmm. is where those folks would end up um, in particular. So you would need to think about that over and above mm -hmm. um, this group. of. This is strictly for psychiatry. This is not for substance abuse. Mm -hmm. This is not for co-occurring other medical or other types of physical health mm -hmm. issues. This because is if purely you go, psych. My, my question is, if you really go back to the mission, right, the safety net, mm -hmm and those that have behavioral health or substance abuse may prevent them from being a working person again. So how do we acclimate them back to society? And should that be part of the study that we need to be looking at? So yes, and, mm -hmm. and there is a very robust, robust set of recommendations around the outpatient and the ambulatory services. Mm -hmm. the, the best answer for you is to get to a place in your system of care that you never have to access these beds. Mm -hmm. that you are doing prevention, that you are doing screening, that when somebody is coming in to see their doctor or when you are out in the community, mm -hmm. that you are engaging people, educating people, just as this group was just talking about the things you need to do about JPS and the good work you do, the same type of education and wellness focus really needs to be very active within the county around behavioral health issues. Th this is not the desired state to get to. It is what one is going to need to have to avoid higher increases in your criminal justice system, higher um, treatment of behavioral health issues within your jails, which is where people end up going when they can't access community-based services or they don't want to access community-based services. Because what, what I'm looking at is as health care changing, Mm -hmm. So it's new technology and all that stuff, from yes. analytics and all that stuff. Yes. And if we reach out to the primary care for those that undetected behavioral health that been prescribed today by a primary care physician, yes. then would the number change as you reach out more and more on the no. am ambulatory side versus the so psychiatric this, side? So this is taking that into account that you are doing that. Right now, you have a, a fairly robust screening for depression and other behavioral health issues in primary care. Not that it cannot improve, 
but but these reduced numbers and reduced by I mean the standard that experts have have written about and believe is what is needed within a community take into consideration that you are doing the screening that you are catching people in their primary care setting that you are catching people who don't go to the doctor as well so technology is only going to take you so far um, medicine and medicine is only going to take you so far. There is a lot more to delivering a system of care for people with behavioral health issues. Yes, ma'am. One come and question. You mentioned there's screening within the outpatient field, but yes. there's no integration of behavioral care services within the primary care. There is some. There's some. There is but some, not and there's co-located, but mm -hmm. there are further enhancements that can be made to, to truly integrate those services and use a population health strategy and that integrated care management strategy that Greg had talked about. That, that would impact, be very helpful. That could impact ultimately this. Absolutely. At some, at some point. But, yes. At some point, yes. But again, I want to be crystal clear. These are very conservative numbers, extremely conservative. This is taking into consideration that you're doing all of these things that we just talked about. Karen, let me ask you a question. So just to make sure I understand these numbers on the beds. Sure. So you took the total population of Tarrant County and then you, you put the formula to that, Correct. not just the JPS population. Correct. So there are some uh, institutions out there not affiliated with JPS that do uh, currently take different levels, whether it's behavioral, uh, geropsych, whatever. How has that been uh, calculated into the total need of beds? Because there may be a point <clears throat> as we go down the road here mm -hmm. uh, where we say, you know, we may want to contract with uh, Arlington Memorial or MCA uh, and we want to utilize some of the services that they've got now rather than try to get the total number down here on this campus. Because one of the things that, you know, you mentioned uh, was getting the people to come to John Peter Smith because of logistics, it's very tough. And therefore, they show up in hospitals all over <coughs> Tarrant County yes. that John Peter Smith never sees and, and will never see because that person doesn't have any way to get down here um, and so where do we where do we throw that piece into the total bed needs or is that in there it's in here so don't we need to be subtracting some of those out so we did so so let me let me just be really clear is that so, based on the 50% then right. so, that's that's so what it is okay. this is 35 beds per 100,000 current estimates are that you should have between 60 and 80 beds. I went with 70 right. in my calculations, so just taking the average there. So based on that, and that, again, it's not being met now anywhere in the country, we use the formula of 35 public beds, okay, not private, public beds. So, so what's at the state facility, what JPS has. Most of this is JPS at this point because you can't get folks in the state facility. Based on that, and the fact that you, you are currently serving about 24% of the population now with psychiatric needs in your beds, that you have that percentage of beds, we, we essentially took this column includes the 50% of the 50% of the literature recommendations. So the gap between here and here would be beds that you would need to contract for or have people uh, go to those other facilities. So it's already built okay. in here. And then this is the gap between this number, 50% and 50%, mm -hmm. in terms of difference of what you have now, right. which is the 130 At JPS. Yeah. Right, yeah. at JPS, yeah. not including MedPsych. Right. I mean, do you want to add anything that I've missed? Sure, go for it. So I, I don't know that you missed anything. The only thing I would add and that might help this group's understanding is so traditionally about fifty four percent of health care is paid for privately with private insurance, self pay, people pulling cash out of their pocket. 
only about 32, 33% of behavioral health care services are paid in that way. So this mix between what is publicly funded behavioral health care and what is publicly funded health care is a different mix um, in our country than what you typically have because behavioral health services have been traditionally underfunded. Private hospitals have, have shied away from um, acute psychiatric care and, and frankly non-acute care. And so that balance of what that expectation is different independent of these numbers. I just say that to give a little bit of context. And we do have, for clarity, we do have contracts with four um, freestanding psychiatric hospitals today where we purchase beds from them on a per patient day basis. Are they basis. all here in Fort Worth? Um, are they? No, there are um, one in Arlington. Is that Millwood? Yeah, Millwood is in Arlington. Sundance is also in Arlington, and we contract with Sundance. Um, and then the other two are in Fort Worth. Okay. So what, what was Oceans now is Wellbridge, and then uh, Mesa Springs is the other one that's okay. in Fort Worth. So okay. there are four total that, that and, and pretty evenly distributed, Oceans being the exception because they specialize in older adult care. And so we don't have as many older adult patients that we refer out as, yeah. as general adult. Okay. Well, what, yes, sir. With those numbers of per 100,000, how do we compare with other major metropolitan areas around the country? So I think, as, as Dr. Badia said, we, we really, I don't know that anywhere is meeting right. um, the current demand. I think one of the challenges that we have that is a little different than some other states is that our state hospital system is increasingly facing the forensic side of this equation. Um, and so a few years ago, there was a ruling that said people from the jail need to get into a bed for competency restoration within 21 days. We're far exceeding that number today. But as and I think it was 15, I'm, I'm going to say 14 or 15, the number of patients, it flipped. Historically, we had had a larger percentage of civil patients in our state hospital system and a smaller percentage of forensic patients. Um, in that year, it it switched in which basically if you look at the trend line you see an X so the civil availability for state hospital beds is rapidly decreasing the forensic access to state hospital beds is increasing um, the total capacity is inadequate in the state hospital beds but it the proportion of people who are making those making up those beds and utilization of those beds is switching to forensic which then creates a burden for local communities on how they're going to be able to meet those needs so taking Tarrant County and comparing it with Bayer and Harris and Travis County how do we how do we stack up in capacity? So I would say that countywide, not just JPS. And I, di I didn't come prepared to answer yeah. that question, so I will I will give a little bit of a, a an off cuff answer and, and ask not that's to be held too accountable to that. Um, and that's what I worry about <laughs> is, is um, giving a non expert answer um, when people are asking that from with an expectation. Um, so Harris County has Harris County Psychiatric Center, which is a fairly large, robust um, system of care that has a, a fairly large number of inpatient beds. Um, Dallas County's Parkland system has a smaller number of beds. Um, they run around 24. Um, I can't speak to the San Antonio. El Paso is looking at a process now where they convert their state hospital to a local hospital system and how to do that. I don't know how well that's going to be received. Um, so we have probably, um, we because we actually have a few more beds here, um, we have the state has purchased some of those beds and actually pay us to keep those individuals here locally because they know they don't have access at the state hospital. So the mix is a little different because they actually fund some of those 132 beds is funded by the state to help provide some some ease to the capacity challenges that we have. So it's a it's a hard apples to apples comparison to make given the dynamics. That, that and Texas is on the lower end of this ratio nationally yeah. as well. And, and the other thing just to keep in mind um, is that. Behavioral health issues are different than other medical issues. They are the issues that we're talking about that land somebody in one of these beds or in one of your jails because of those symptoms that I was describing at the beginning of, of my part of this talk is because people's brains don't work right. And, and so you get medication and other kinds of supports to help people manage their day-to-day -day lives. Often what we see happen with people who have serious mental health issues is they, when they do start taking medicine, they start to get better, and then they start to think they don't need the medicine anymore. And so they stop taking the medicine, and they get sick again, and they end up in a constant cycle. And, and it's that cycle that you really need this very robust system of care to help to support and manage and, and really be aware of when people are cycling and getting sicker so that you can catch that before they end up in these beds. But you're going to always have people who end up in beds. 
so it, it is it is a, a very different kind of medical issue that you're trying to address. So I'm Karen, you ready for before you run off, I'm sorry, I got to ask you one question off, about numbers. Wanna... I'm sorry, but I want to make sure I understand the 35 yes. Yes, sir. public beds. So you said experts recommend between 60 and 80. You took correct. an average of 70, took half of that. That's where you came with 35. Is that correct? correct? That that's is correct. correct. Okay, so my question is. Is the, 50, is the 60 to 80, how is that derived? I mean, where did that get derived from? It's, it's derived by the experts' opinions about what they have seen in different systems of care. There is not hard science around this. I okay. mean, it's part of why I'm comfortable coming to you and saying 35, yeah. right, with all these caveats. Um, I, and I think it's doable given technology, given evolutions in medicine, given the development of a very robust system of care. But it, it's going to be hard. Okay. But that's where Thank it comes you. from. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, quickly go through the last two slides, uh, which are about uh, medical education. Uh, you have uh, fully accredited programs in a number of uh, areas at JPS. And as I said earlier, that family medicine program that is uh, so uh, competitive and, and uh, a great reputation. And you're able to attract uh, uh, students and trainees for, um, for training. Uh, area of focus would be to um, uh, plan for responding as a, um, as a county uh, around need for extra GME, um, extra training for uh, internal medicine and internal medicine subspecialties uh, that um, are in high demand and have high wait times right now so that you need to build uh, capacity there. Um, and recruiting your trainees to uh, be part of the system. That's already happening, but, but to do that uh, uh, more because you need those uh, primary care uh, physicians. Uh, developing a full partnership with the, uh, with the medical school, and then, of course, having the physical facilities to uh, attract those uh, trainees. Um, core part of mission, and I would say that that, that other piece of the uh, Education and the reason why I put a focus on it is that pipeline to uh, the people that you need. So tighter affiliation with, a, with medical school, uh, knowing what you want to get from it, having institutional uh, goals defined, uh, right? Uh, increasing uh, support for uh, education and behavioral health, and then incorporating population health throughout uh, the curriculum of all of these uh, training programs. And for a little later. <laughs> so, so what's your recommendation related to increased capacity for GME? Uh, that there, that you come together with others in the county to define um, that you come together with others in the county to define what those ought to look like to serve all of Town County. That that rather than do it as a single system to, to do that as a, a, a county. From a funding standpoint? Or? Yeah, planning standpoint, um, yeah, and coming, <coughs> coming together to, um, to drive those uh, positions and, and, and training opportunities here. Yeah, if I can just comment. So it starts with educational opportunities sure. because you can have all kinds of GME, but if you can't train them well, it's not worthwhile. If you do the numbers in Tarrant County, which, which I've done, if you look at national median population to GME slots, we could accommodate 700 new slots here in Tarrant County, which there's no place else in the country that can accomplish that. So we could put a huge dent in the physician shortage uh, in the state. We could keep um, some. We don't want to keep all of them, but we could keep some of our talented young people. But the other thing that I think is critical is the continuum of their training that you do keep. Um, because as soon as they leave one school and go to someplace else, their training gets it just gets all skewed. This is a huge opportunity here. This does not exist anywhere else in the country. Yeah. But it is a funding issue. Yeah. But the educational material is here. And to your point, it's not done well if it's done in single institutions. So we're actually in serious discussions looking for a consortium model, which is very fun to dream about. It's a little more difficult to operationalize, but we have an opportunity here to try it. Go ahead. No, 
ages before you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for using my line against me. <laughs> I'm pondering, uh, based on your experience and observation, is there a model out there in the country that you would consider the best practice to help us develop and sustain a long-term collaboration to help with the prevention side? Okay, I know. Um, Public Health and JPS and Tanton County, we, we, we focus on the, the operation and maybe two to three plan, through two to three year plan forward, right? But throughout the discussions that we have been having in the past few weeks, uh, I think everybody agree that there got to be some sort of a collaborative, long-term strategic uh, working together, okay? Is there a model out there in the United States that help us sustain this level for the long run? I'm talking about 10, 20 years. Is there such an animal out there? Uh, where, where we have communities that have multi-institutional um, stakeholders coming together to produce results for a population or a county. Uh, Yes. Yes. There, there have been the various degrees of success there, um, and um, we can get you some of those that we've helped out with, some, some results that uh, uh, different communities have, have gotten. It is um, uh, challenging no matter where you do this or attempt to do it, and it's getting um, stakeholders to um, Move the move the iron, so to speak, to go further down the field to see where the you know the opportunities are. So there's been some you know very I would say uh, incredible wins in terms of covering populations, transforming the primary care, getting uh, specialty for larger and larger sets of people. Um, L. A. Cook County. There's some very good examples. I would be the first to say that these are not a complete transformation of the healthcare system in any one of those locations. Um, but by creating that accountability structure, by working with public health and having the healthcare delivery system come together, not as itself, but with other healthcare delivery systems. Uh -oh. Is that me? No. <laughs> um, it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> but that there have been some big wins sure, that, that describe outcomes across populations. So it would be nice if you can share some of that best practice Absolutely. with us. Yeah. 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 It's a very good recommendation. Yeah. Are we struggling microphone place? Huh? <laughs> He gets the same treatment for me. He right? does. <laughs> As a hospital district, we're struggling a little for a while now the bit, uh, regarding the uh, FQ, uh, Federal Qualifying Health Clinic. Could you educate us a little bit about the difference between your suggestion and why we should look at it? Because at the end of the day, we have to execute on that. And we also have to worry about the financial impact to the hospital itself. <laughs> So can, could you highlight, or we can take it offline later? Yeah, so FQHC, you have one, right? NTAC, uh, most communities of this, well, not most, but a, a lot of communities of this size have many um, FQHCs. Um, it is one way of building up the primary care. When you think about doing it all yourself and how much need there was there, it, it really requires multi-institutional and other stakeholders doing that. Uh, FQHCs, which are federally qualified health centers, and get um, special payments for doing more than your usual primary care. There's additional services that are wrapped around it. Services that you want to see happen, like uh, care management and population health, um, enabling services like transportation, these other things that FQHCs um, do and serve uninsured uh, as well. They get a special payment to do that. Um, and it you know, it increases the resources of the community by bringing in those dollars and helps you to serve primary care. And that's what the FQHCs are about, is primary care. That's great. You get more of a population if you're in partnership with them covered, and then you can 
deliver specialty services, acute care, behavioral health, other pieces of the uh, of the delivery system. So, the, the challenge is the facility fee when you move or do FQAC. You oh, you're talking that. about uh -huh. the potential, and and many uh, and many places have done that. Move their um, uh, primary care centers to be public entity FQHC. That's a, uh, there's a lot of pluses and minuses and ways to think about it, and that would require a, a deeper conversation. We've helped people, uh, systems, uh, go through that uh, before, and there's a lot to consider there. Okay, any other questions from anybody? I know we're running a little bit over. Um, thank you, uh, Greg and Karen. We appreciate that. Uh, so flexible with us. Um, you have a new schedule, by the way, and what's new about it is I think everybody got one. I hope they did. Where we put another meeting in June. Okay, did everybody notice that we added one just to kind of <clears throat> in discussions with GK and, and some of the staff to, to try to push a little bit harder to, to get through this because the really fun part. <laughs> is about uh, one, two, three more meetings, and then we get to prioritization and, and really coming up with some hard decisions. So we will have gotten all the data by then, uh, or hopefully all the data. We may have to ask for more, but, but the big, the big data-consuming uh, function of this committee will be over with, and then we will have to make hard decisions. So. Well, Randy, I think that's why this our discussion today was really interesting. To see people participating and going back and forth that we all learn from each other and that the more we do of that by the time we get to making the priorities I think this is going to bubble up and it's yeah. going to be kind of crystal clear yeah. um, but the discussions actually so GK anything else not at this time. Okay. Appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you, everyone. Well,